I was sent initially in, in 1985-86 by the head of the Rosicrucian Order to visit the Rorick Museum in New York. At that time, I knew nothing about plots to murder, mur collective murder uh, that would come. My first visit to uh, uh, Litchfield Estate, Shugborough Hall, resulted in uh, my being pulled into the back of a, of a black van and, and uh, literally tortured. Back in um, nearly two years ago, we put out a challenge to the world, really, to say, can you work out what this um, inscription and this coded monument actually means? What is so explosive about this code is not only that it infers or implies or in a sense almost directs the seeker to where this artifact may be hidden. Wolfram von Eschenbach refers to the grail first, not as a chalice, but as a stone, and an inscribed stone. Lapis exilis, then he says the stone they call the grail. And he's not the only one. It's repeated through all the literature that the grail is not a chalice in its first understanding. It's a stone, an inscribed stone. In, again, the Da Vinci Code, the rose line is equated with the term Roslin. And here is where some of the most grievous errors are made in misleading comments that have a lot of people believing a, a, a lot of fanciful nonsense. But people come in here with, with you know, expectations. The amount of times that I've been asked for, where is the Holy Grail? Yes. You know? Because secret societies tended to adhere more to the idea that there was indivisible unity than did Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That secret had to be protected, maintained, and passed along, and people had to be protected and defended who, who passed that information along. And as a result, we get this complexity of codes and ciphers.